Welcome, everybody, once again to the Too Easy Project. I am your host, Bill Berg. Today, we've got episode 12. We're going to be talking about nutrition and diet science. Basically, we're going to talk about how the food that you eat affects your body, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients. Uh, everything you might have thought you heard before, but we're going to make sure that you listen and really understand uh, what you've been hearing since you were a little kid. Eat your veggies, eat well-rounded meals, things like that. Today, I've got my cousins, Nick and Maria Van and Langenberg. Um, that is my last name for anybody who didn't know who's been listening. Berg is just shortening of that, and I can, I'm sure you can imagine why I shortened it to that. Van and Langenberg. Uh, both of them have majored in nutrition-related fields, um, dietetics, nutrition science, food science. They are going to be filling us in on their experience, their knowledge that they've gained through their education at UW-Madison as well as uh, their careers. Um, so we've got the, some of the best of the best here talking to us, and hopefully you guys enjoy. Okay, so today I've got my cousins, Maria and Nick Vanden Langenberg. Um, but you guys are both family members of mine, and, and uh, I know you guys pretty well, but that's not the whole reason you're on the show. And you guys both have uh, degrees and education, experience in the realm of nutrition and diet and things like that. Like, so what, what are your majors? You know, Maria, you just graduated, and Nick, you've been graduated for a few years. But uh, Maria, what, what did you uh, major in? Yeah, so I majored in nutrition and dietetics as one major but it's a specific major to become a registered dietitian. So essentially just a bachelor's of science in nutritional sciences, but just more specific. Okay. And then Nick, what, what was your major then? Yeah, I, I majored in food science. I graduated from UW-Madison in the spring semester of 2017. What's the difference between dietetics and foods, food science? I mean, what... Because they'll sound very similar just to, yeah. to a regular person uh, like me. Maria, you want to talk about that? Because I, I took food science classes and one nutrition class, but Maria okay. took both food science and dietetics classes. Yeah, so um, kind of what separates nutritional sciences from dietetics is just that dietetics, you're becoming the registered dietitian, and Nutrisci is usually to do more research-based stuff. Um, so I'm more on like the clinical human side of things um but then that differs from food science in like food science is a lot of like how food works and right. like how you can make quality better and safety better and okay. so I like know the basis of that information but then I'm more of like okay how does it affect the body and how can we make people healthier and like cure them from diseases and stuff so I'm essentially more just like the human interaction piece of things and Nick's more like the food safety quality production so it's like you're you're in like a um like health services field then and mm -hmm. Nick would be like more like in a production of like a, a food company production yeah. company. Mm -hmm. is that yeah and then Nick you know you've been at a job um for the past few years now at least the last time that I've talked to you and for years now are you still at that same job when you want to tell me about that yeah, so after I graduated uh, from Madison in 2017, got a job in Madison at a bakery called Oak House Bakery, and I've been there ever since, so coming up on three years. Um, and started out when I got there, we had one production line, uh, and it's we've been fortunate, it's growing quite a bit. We now have four production lines, actually just opened up another production line this week. Um, so it's been really cool to see that fast of growth that quickly. Um, but in terms of my specific jobs there, I've done uh, some work on research and development with new granolas, anywhere from keto granolas to really sugary, uh, your, kind of your classic granolas, uh, and then some R&D on gluten-free breads and gluten-free cookies as well. Huh. Um, so we're more focused on uh, large-scale bakery, <clears throat> especially granola is our, our main business. 
you know, yeah, I know you said like that sugary granola and I, I can't go to the supermarket and find granola. That's like not way higher in calories than normal cereal yeah. know, or, or anything like that. So you said you're tr trying to make like a keto granola. Does mm -hmm. it, does it taste as good <laughs> or, uh, so we have, we have a couple formulas that taste pretty good, but the, the thing is you usually, if you want to get it keto or really, really low sugar, you usually have to use a fake sweetener. Mm -hmm. um, so you get that kind of weird alcoholic, uh, fake sugar aftertaste, uh, a little bit, unfortunately. As I'm drinking my diet Pepsi while we're talking about nutrition. <laughs> Um, so everyone knows as far as diet goes, just to be healthy, you're taught as a kid, eat your veggies, you know, drink your milk, um, eat, avoid super processed foods, high in sugar, you know, don't have that cookie, things like that. But what, what's really the reasoning behind all of that? So I guess, uh, we'll get more into, uh, later specifics, but firstly, the macronutrients, fats, proteins, and carbs. What are their roles in the body, and what are the what are their health? What are their uh, positive effects, and what are some of their negative effects? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of just a lot, especially like biochemically. But carbs essentially are really important because they produce glucose in the end. Most of them do when they're broken down. And glucose is what fuels your whole body. And so that really is important in the brain and your red blood cells. Um, and so that kind of breaks down into when you're doing keto, you're like taking away that glucose. Yeah, I've, um, heard, that, I've heard that if you're on a low carb diet, it can have a negative effect on like brain function, um, especially for college students who are trying to obviously strain their brain to do well on these, <laughs> these exams and and their schedules and things like that. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. So then yeah. keep going. Yeah. So um, it's really carbs are important. I think just for the whole body in general, it is stored in muscles in um, fat pockets that you have. Um, it helps retain water in your body. It helps your organs function. So carbs overall are really important. That's why you need kind of the, 45 to 65 percent of your diet as carbs for that reason okay. and then from there like protein um helps just a lot of your muscles and other functions um biochemically it's like all different um amino acids are important in different ways in the cells and stuff so um, so people who are like trying to get huge in the weight room they just you know, eat your protein a ton of protein um, and then someone like my mom will see me with my whey protein bucket and say, oh, you know, that's, that's not good for you. You got to stop that. And, and to a point, she's probably right. Um, but what, what, cause obviously there are some, like you're saying, those amino acids have other function things like that. So what other duties does protein carry out in the body besides just making you big? Yeah, I can't think of all of them right now. It's been a while since biochem, but like definitely just cell functions, like certain ones help to um, keep the cell growing and functioning and just like transporting production. nutrients, I think a little bit too sometimes. Yeah. 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 They have a lot of like, there's a whole list. I think they help in some, like you said, like vitamin transport and kind of those yeah. types of things. From but what I've, it from is what, important. From what I've seen or read about, protein is one of the most like diverse nutrients in what it really accomplishes. Um, mm -hmm. like we said, carbs is really only an energy source, but I mean, it has other things too, but that's, that's the main one, right? It, mm -hmm. Um, then protein just does a lot of different things. Okay. So then, so then what's fats, uh, pros, because you ask almost anybody, you know, should you eat fat and include fat in your diet? They're probably going to say, no, it's unhealthy. So what, what are some good things about fats though? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fats, uh, you need some amount of fats, even if it's from plant-based or cell membrane function. So that's a very important part of fats is having, you know, at least a small percentage in your diet to uh, have in that, that lipid bilayer that's important for cell structure and maintenance. 
Yeah, I mean, I, even on a cell level um, is what you're saying, but I've heard too that your body structure, it just can't even support itself without fat on it. You know, yeah. Like, that, like just your skeletal, you know, your whole body, like it will, it can't support itself without just what is the minimum, like two or 3% body fat is like, you cannot go below that or something like yeah, that. I think, I think it might be even a little more like six, six percent. Yeah. 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 We learned just, I mean, beyond that, it's, I mean, kind of obvious, but like fat is just really important. Like you were saying structurally of like providing cushion for your organs and um just kind of all those little things that sometimes we hate but like that is what down to that level percent it like then takes away from keeping your organs all intact and like just your body being able to walk and function and sit down without like hurting and stuff like that yeah and from a, a diet perspective too i think fat is important or helpful in satiation so feeling full oh yeah so if you just eat a, a bunch of vegetables, you know, that's really healthy, but if you're probably still going to be hungry after that and maybe even more hungry than before you ate. And so adding just a little bit of olive oil or butter in with those vegetables can turn it from a meal that's kind of bland, you know, doesn't really fill you up, but might put you over the hump and filling you up a little more. Yeah. So really, I mean, I know a lot of people who might feel guilty if they add butter to their to whatever meal they're having but really it's not that bad but so there is a certain amount like you said of fats but what like how much i mean maybe you don't even know the answer to this question but you know is it like is it like a big stick of butter that you just slap off or is it just a little bit of olive oil you know like just because yeah it's hard for me to grasp and it's probably hard for mm -hmm. people to grasp like how much is that that little amount as, as much as you want willie <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah really that's just yeah no, I have you, I, have I you know. seen have you seen know. this since quarantine? I don't know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I think with fat, so it breaks down into three categories essentially. So you have saturated fats, and then you have unsaturated fats, and then unsaturated fats breaks into mono and poly unsaturated fats. Um and so that's where it kind of gets complicated because oh, yeah. then that kind of determines how much you should have of things. Because like, I'm um, sure, you know, the fat in some nuts is probably different than the fat from, you know, the, the fat you cut off a T-bone steak. Yeah. 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 And that's when what should be less of is like more of those fats that you can see solid at room temperature. Okay. Um, but Yeah. But when you get to some of those like olive oil or like healthy fats, like avocado is really known for being a healthy fat. Some of those are needed in sometimes a little extra quantities because some of those fats um, and omega threes and stuff make um, anti-inflammatories in your body, which helps just support lo healthy life functions. Um, so some of those have different biochemical reasons of how much you should have of each of those fats even yeah it's it's a good question willie and i think the the most frustrating thing about it is that a lot of people including myself want that exact answer of like how how much should i have of saturated fat or butter yeah. or olive oil and uh recently i think it was within the last few years the uh, U.S. government even went back on its previous statement about cholesterol and said, oh, you can, within the reasonable amount, you can have as much cholesterol as you want uh, from eggs or, or other sources. And so that's kind of what makes this so frustrating is we, we don't necessarily know yet. Um, and it seems like people flip-flop on either the, the newest research or the newest trendy diet, and that just makes yeah. it really hard to know what, what's true. Yeah. I mean, even I think like my parents said when they were like my age or younger or whatever, it was like trans fats was what was bad. Maybe that was yeah. the case years later too, but it's just kind of like you're saying, I know it's just goes back and forth and that's the same for almost anything it seems like, because you could read an article about how a ketogenic diet is, does wonders for weight loss. And then you could read another article that says the exact opposite with just as many yeah. participants that showed opposite results. 
you know, yeah. so that's what's tough about these, these kind of things. But, and it's also tough because I'm trying to ask you questions about how the cells use their nutrients and stuff, but it's hard because obviously we don't, you know, we can't see it directly or like yeah. experience it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so aside from what you should eat, um, you said that carbs are great because there's their energy source and they're broken down into glucose. And I'm under the impression that that's like you said, what your body uses as its fuel. So then how is it possible for your body to use fat or like protein as fuel? Because that does happen. You know, any calories mm-hmm. that you ingest are used as fuel or can be. Um, so how, how does that work then if your body or your cells prefer using glucose? That's just what I don't understand. It's a good question. Maria, do you have an answer? Um, I have some vague ideas, but okay. okay. So essentially each one of those things has kind of a different pathway it takes and a different kind of reason and role in the body once you digest it. Yeah. And so then glucose is like that fuel and it will take it and then it kind of splits it up in different ways. Um, so it'll like use it for the brain. It'll use it for the um, red blood cells. And then when it has extra, it'll start to go in um, to different areas like your liver and your muscles and stuff and start to store it. So that's kind of where all that goes. And then there's different like then proteins will come in and assemble itself in the muscle first for like that sort of like fuel in there and then go into like cell production and all that and then fats go in and kind of do something different and so I think glucose is just that one type of fuel in a certain area um, to like keep things moving Um, but then it can like when you get into keto kind of the biochemical like pathways around that then your body like slowly starts to go into starvation mode. And then through those things, it'll use up all the stores in your fat pockets and then all the stores in your muscles and then kind of go through that until then the brain isn't even using anymore. Then it takes those extra fat and protein and switches over to using ketones. Um, And that's the other source that it can use is the ketones from like fat basically how do you guys feel about the keto diet now that we've kind of mentioned it a couple times i mean here's my experience with it the people who are most in mostly positive about it are people who are not that informed about it you know so unless you guys are opposite but do you guys uh, are you guys in favor of it as far as someone who's trying to lose weight? And uh, I, other, another question, are you in favor of someone who's trying to be healthy? Cause those don't uh, always go hand in hand. Yeah. I, I personally think it's a great tool, uh, for somebody to, that wants to lose weight quickly. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I've actually, my boss, I've seen him lose, uh, a number of pounds and keep it off with the keto diet. Um, and a couple other people I've, I've seen do the same thing. Um, so I think it's very effective and shutting off pounds quickly. Now, in terms of a, a diet that I would look at and say, I think this is sustainable and I'm able to do this the rest of my life. I don't know if I would get behind it as much just because it, in our current, culture with the different food options we have and the way we eat i just don't see at least for myself how somebody could sustain that yeah or the general population could sustain it for their their lives and so i think we are question about health i would lean towards uh it's not necessarily healthy but it's a very good way to lose weight quickly and then maybe turn to alternatives to keep the weight off and live a more sustainable diet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a tool and that's a good word because the same effect can be, can be achieved through eating carbs. You can still lose the weight and it might be more sustainable. Like you're saying, um, because the people in my life that have tried keto, it seems like there's a lot of like 
binging or crashing because at some point you have to stop keto unless you do it until the day you die you're going to stop doing keto at some point you know and when that day yep. comes it's going to you're going to you know I, you're going to be doing good and you're going to see results and then you eat you you say okay this is my day i can eat carbs and then you go all out and then you're just you're bloated and you just get all discouraged you know well meanwhile you could have been eating moderate carbs and seeing gradual weight loss and you know you don't hit that that wall you know yeah um, yeah i think from my perspective i'm very much so on the like very against it side um i i kind of agree that like it is a very good initial um but i've studied it a lot in school it's always the hot topic like yeah. my professors had everything to say about it um but like initially you biochemically are losing a lot of weight because you're losing a lot of water mm -hmm. um and that's because your glycogen stores are breaking down and that's what helps store your body with the water which is supposed to have like the 60 percent water or whatever anyway so that is a little unhealthy that all of a sudden like you see quick results because you're just losing water yeah and those um carb stores that are really important and then, yeah, you get a lot of weird effects for a little while because you're switching over to ketones, but that's where I start to see it as a little unhealthy because your body was created to use glucose, especially your brain and your red blood cells, which are those last two to like switch over to ketones. Um, and originally this diet was made for people on epilepsy um, to control their seizures because of that different fuel for your brain. And even people who have epilepsy, they only keep them on for two years max because they don't want to keep them on beyond that because of just the diet. Um, so they'll take them off no matter what after two years to see number one, like if they can then sustain themselves a little more, um, from those seizures, but also just for health reasons too. Um, and that's where it does get a little wonky is like, I don't think it's healthy long term, just because you are eating a lot, like it's very much so a lot of fat, and a lot of meat. And a lot of times it's like an excuse for people like, yeah, slab a bunch of butter on something and stuff like that, Jeez. that it's, and then there's, you can't eat fruits, which are like, <laughs> so good, and so needed. <laughs> like I get you know, and maybe for someone who's very overweight and, you know, the best thing for them at the moment is just to lose weight, lose fat, like just to mm -hmm. lose fat as quickly mm -hmm. as possible because yeah. of their condition, you know? Okay. But my roommate freshman and sophomore year of college was, was pretty overweight. I mean, he was like the typical PC gamer that didn't leave his chair ever, you know? And, and he was, he was pretty overweight. And then he started, he lost about 40 to 50 pounds on keto and I went over to his house one time for dinner and, and we were talking about what we could have and what we couldn't have. And he said, Oh yeah, I can't have any of those carrots or that broccoli because of their carb carb count. I'm like, this is what's good for you. And he's like, Oh yeah, you can just eat all the cheese and bacon you want. That's all I eat. And that just, that seems counter counterintuitive to me. I mean, you might be losing weight, but in the end, that just doesn't seem healthier from a common sense point of view. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think we have the uh, long-term health effect studies yet to know like what, what does it do to our bodies if you eat cheese and bacon and eggs with a little bit of, let's say, broccoli once a day, um, but mostly fat and protein. Yeah. What does that do to our hearts, our arteries? I, I don't know if the, the studies are necessarily there yet. Yeah. But I just keep thinking about these people who, like, like our dads, you know, Jim and Paul, who grew up on a diet that is probably, you know, it's not a keto diet. It's not whatever diet. It's, you know, what they had to eat. They had a lot of, they had a lot of meat, I'm, I'm sure. You know, they had a lot of dairy product, a lot of dairy products, um, you know, and bread is always one of the easiest, cheapest things to have. So, you know, those things and fruits and veggies that you can grow. You know, it's not a keto diet, but it's also not a very, it's just not a very conscientious diet in any way. But these people yeah. live like the guys who live through World War II and, you know, go through all this trauma and they're still over a hundred years old. They didn't, they didn't do the keto diet. They didn't mm -hmm. do all this and they're living this long. And I just think it's because 
they're eating real food that you can, you know, it's not yep. engineered with all this other stuff in it, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Willie. I've, I've actually read a, a decent amount on like about this, this same topic because at, especially after graduating when I had a little more time to read, I've just been really curious, like what, what is out there in the popular science world? What is out there from a scientific standpoint of what is the healthiest thing? Yeah. It, it seems like if you kind of filter through stuff and take in different viewpoints, it seems like everyone's kind of pointing to that same idea of eating food that's as little processed as possible and food that doesn't contain a bunch of simple carbohydrates or added sugar yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of like whole foods that you know are good for you so like you pointed out vegetables fruits uh even even meat you know it's it's still kind of a whole food um if it's you know not over processed so it's just kind of interesting you, you read a bunch of different people who recommend you know the keto diet and then you read books that of people who only recommend vegan diets and trying to find where the common ground is there, I think is, is helpful in deciphering what's healthy. You're always going to find people who are in favor of a certain diet and say it's the, the one that works best. Like my roommate, mm -hmm. my roommate came to me once and he said he was going to try the carnivore diet, which is only meat. You, you literally only eat meat. Yeah. And, and I'm like, why? I mean, yeah, 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 people were write good reviews about it. And I'm sure, you know, if you're eating nothing but protein and a little bit of fat, then you're going to shed some pounds. But at what cost? I mean, again, you have yeah. to not go, you have to go back to not being a carnivore diet at some point in your life, you know, and that, and then what is that change going to have on your body and the discouragement that comes from finally eating these carbs again, or, you know, and, and the, the, you know, the micronutrients that you're missing out on by not getting all these fruits and vegetables and, and things too, because those are important too. Like all your vitamins and minerals you can't get from just a certain food group. Um, yeah. So that's the other reason I don't like all these like certain specified food diets is because there's nutrients that you probably will have to take in supplement form at that point to get, which I mean, that doesn't, that also just doesn't seem like the most naturally healthy way to do things. So that's just yeah. my take on things, you know, yeah. like you said, sustainability. Um, I mean, that's, that's what yeah. it is in the end too. If you can sustain this until the day you die, it's going to be the, the, the healthiest thing. I think, yep. I mean, unless you're eating McDonald's <laughs> max every day until the day you die, but you know, that's but you know what I mean? Sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah. It'll be sustainable because your life will be cut short. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might save some money too, but um, yeah, kind of back to the vitamin thing too. I think, um, you want to like find the most amount of like micronutrients in your food just because there's this whole debate, especially in the um, nutrition world that vitamins and minerals and stuff, supplements that you take aren't regulated. Mm. And so there's a bunch with that too of like, is this safe? Like what's actually in this? Like yeah packaging and all of that that this comes at a cost too and it's expensive like and there's additives take... in it too to make it like taste good i mean you the gummy yeah we're like oh i'm gonna supplement with this oh i'm vegan but i need protein so i'm gonna get this protein shake well yeah i mean what else is in there you know i don't know so anyway yeah Look, i think can, oh, can you define okay. micronutrients maria yeah so it's um vitamins minerals is Are water a micronutrient? The, I think it's technically a macronutrient oh, because okay. you need so much of it. Yeah. Or maybe not. Maybe it is micro. I, it is I'm one of sure. them. Yeah, it is one of them, though. I think there's six of them. It's like water, vitamins, minerals, carbs, fats, protein, and I think one other thing. So what do vitamins and minerals do? I mean, again, again, everyone knows... You got to get your vitamins and minerals or whatever, but what do they, I mean, what do they accomplish in your body and why they, do you need them? Yeah, they do a lot. Um, I probably won't get into all of it, sure. but yep. basically like everything. Um, I had literally like a whole class 
class on it and we didn't even like touch the surface of all of them but each one like vitamin k helps with like blood clotting and like when you get a cut and if you don't have vitamin k then you your blood can't um patch up to make a scab and um there's like b and c which are the um i think the water soluble ones and then the other ones are fat soluble so they kind of each do separate things um, vitamin C and I think C does some working together to do some like cell repairing. Vitamin A and C I think are antioxidants so they help like remove bad things and also do cell repair. So kind of a lot of those really small like they're called micronutrients because you don't need as much of them but they do a lot of the little things in your body. So if That's you don't funny. have those it can be detrimental. I heard this now, let me try to repeat it. I just thought of it. I, I saw it a couple months ago. It was like macronutrients being proteins, carbs, and fats are for, for like energy or not. Re- I don't remember now, but then the micronutrients are for, for health or something like that. Oh yeah. Macronutrients are for performance. You, you, you change them based on your goals of what you're trying to achieve basically like in you know, performance wise. And then micronutrients are for like, you know, health and actually being healthy because, you know, if I have a high protein diet, I'm just trying to gain muscle. I'm going to focus on my macronutrients, not my micronutrients, because I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how much vitamin A I have. Just, I'm just saying vitamin A, but, um, but then if I'm just trying to be healthy and live a long, you know, sustainable, healthy life, I'm not going to try to have a super high protein diet. What I'm going to worry about is, am I getting all these micronutrients, which are going to, yeah, if I get cut, am I going to be able to heal myself? If I get sick, am I going to be able to be on my feet the next day? Am I, you know, if I get some disease that a normal elderly person might, who hasn't had all these, their, you know, the right diet, maybe they might be susceptible to it, but I've, you know, think so. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I think, uh, it it sounds cool to talk about your macros, like mm-hmm. oh, how are your macros doing, Willie? Yeah. But uh, the micros are kind of like the behind the stage, uh, unseen heroes because, like vitamin C, for example, you know, if you're stuck out at sea, only eating rats every once in a while, you're probably going to get scurvy, and then your gums are going to start bleeding because you don't have vitamin C. So they're kind of the, the behind the scenes players that keep your body functioning yeah and how I mean, you see the <clears throat> these high caliber athletes who are on these diets that are really geared towards performance you know like i've just talked about and and a lot of them just you know the toll of their uh endeavors obviously have you know have an effect on their body but i'm sure the diets they have too are play a role and you just see the rough shape that a lot of these high caliber athletes are in at the end of their life you know, I mean, just, I'm sure that if they had, had a more well-rounded diet, I guess for the people who are listening, um, because like, I'm sure anyone who's listening and they want to get in the weight room and build muscle, they're not wanting me to talk about how to be healthy and live to be 90 years old. They want to know how to get big in the weight room, which, which if you don't, you know, which you're not going to be in the weight room for as long as you want to be, uh, unless you focus on these micronutrients as well. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah I would agree with that um so basically you have a set level of based on your age of how much and kind of life stage sometimes of um how much of each micronutrient you should have and that's pretty much the same across the border like another girl could be heavier than I am but still need the same amount of micronutrients as me Um, or even someone smaller, but then macronutrients, like you were saying, it's definitely different based on the person, like someone who's way more athletic than me might need more carbs, like if they're running long distances or something. Um, But kind of those, yeah, micros are like across the board. And what is also scary about them is they also have like, usually toxicity levels. If you have too much, you have to like be in this range. And those really help you with like the small things and the behind the scenes. And like Nick was saying, if you don't have vitamin C, then you're going to get scurvy, then you can't perform. So that's also important. Um, 
but then with those macros you can kind of like change it based on more of your lifestyle and kind of how you want it to look and how you want it to treat your body to do those things like build muscle or run longer distances or perform this way or that way yeah and it's just tough because it's so e- so much easier to change your macros not only in like just not only in changing what you eat, but you can see it, you know, you see a steak and you know what you're eating, you yeah. know, you can kind of gauge like, okay, this is how much protein or carbs is in this much chicken. You know, if I, like they say, the you know, the portion sizes, but it's just, you can't see the micronutrients. So a lot of people just kind of brush them away. At least I usually do because you just can't gauge it. You know, it's almost impossible unless you know exactly what is in, you know, each thing that you're eating. Um, so I guess, mm-hmm. How can people be more mindful of that? I mean, do you buy less processed foods? Is that what it is? Or do you have to just look at the nutrition label? Or, you know, how do you, how can you be more conscious of micronutrients? Yeah, I think just overall eating a balanced diet can just help with that. Like if you are only eating like the carnivore diet, it's going to be really obvious. You're probably not getting certain like nutrients. Um, So even if you are being mindful of making fruits and vegetables like half of your plate at le- trying to at least per meal like you should be getting some of those things and if you're eating some carbs and like try to eat very balanced you usually should be hitting a lot of those targets um or I don't know like even today I had to research some like what is calcium all in besides like dairy and I was just like looking at some of those things so even just kind of being a little educated on where you can find some of those things. Um, But even like, it's not bad to take a multivitamin every day just to make sure, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you guys if there's any popular like nutritional like facts that are out there or or believed by everybody that just kind of drive you nuts after having been in school for this. Because everyone knows since they're a kid, drink your milk, or at least, you know, drink milk, uh, eat your fruits and veggies, you know, have this much, you know, like the food pyramid. So is, is there anything that's, that we're taught as a society that's kind of skewed by the, the market out there and the people who are selling us the food? I mean, there's a couple things that come to my mind right away. Um, and I'll try to think of other ones here. But one is a little bit off the beaten path, but I've heard a handful of people say to me, oh, uh, if they're on like a gluten sensitive diet, oh, I can't have potatoes because they have gluten in them. Or like, oh, Maria can't have potatoes because they have gluten in them. And that's not true. Potatoes are gluten free naturally. Sometimes in processing, they're uh, cut with like a wheat product. So then they're not gluten free, uh, but naturally they're gluten free. So that that drives me a little crazy because that's just not true. Um, and then another one I can think of is people saying, oh, but it has natural sugar. So like, oh, but it, <laughs> we can it, talk about this all day. I think I got, that's my pet yeah. peeve too. <laughs> oh, like, but it, but it uses honey. So it's a natural sugar. So it's good for you. And that's from what I understand, that's just not necessarily true. I mean, sugar, sugar, your body's not going to see honey and be like, oh, you're doing us so much, so much better than just cane sugar. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get fat from that. So yeah, I, I, in my last episode, I, I said that I use honey as a sweetener for things where I would normally use something else. Like some people put sugar in their coffee or something, or some people put, you know, syrup on their oatmeal, but I would use honey. Um, just because I feel better about it. Not necessarily do I think it's really any healthier i just it for me you know it's for my own mindset i feel really bad putting in sugar into my coffee but just yeah. something about it i don't know it's just because here's how my mind works if i say i'm going to be on a diet that day and then i have what is obviously outside of my diet like pouring sugar in something the act of actually taking sugar and pouring it in something just throws me off. And then as soon as I'm off from my diet, the whole rest of the day, just, I just binge, yeah. I, you know, like as soon as you it's there the rest of the day. Yes. But if it's honey, I feel better about it. And I don't have that, that down, you know, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Um, yeah. So 
just, that's just that's my mindset for it. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I hate when people say, um, oh, well, like I saw this, per- this person tweeted and it got so many retweets and, and likes. Did you know a banana has 110 calories and it's almost all sugar? You know, <laughs> <laughs> like toss it. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's so different than having the same amount of calories in a soda because they compared it to like a soda or something. Because it's like, oh, the same amount of sugar, same amount of calories. And I'm like, that's, that sugar is going straight into your bloodstream with no barrier at all. I mean, it's just going right in there. It's going to spike your insulin levels. And, but like a banana, your body has to break it down and extract the nutrients from it. You know, yeah. it's, it's, a steadier, it's a steadier increase in your insulin levels because your body has to take the time to absorb it. And you get this fiber with it, like, you know, like, in that's within the banana and cell walls and things like that so that's just that's just one of my pet peeves too is just the whole added sugar natural sugar thing because you know fruits and sodas yeah yeah and the the reason i used honey and cane sugar is because uh they're very two very simple compounds cane sugar is pure sugar and honey is uh, a mixture of fructose and glucose with the rest being basically water there's some other you know very small flavor compounds in there with a little bit of nutrients but you're right comparing like a banana to a soda very different because it's important not to just break a whole food down into its macronutrients you have to account for the whole food in and of itself and how that interacts with your body not just the numbers on the the ingredient label and like you said um, Maria, it is about, you know, like, like sugars are what your body uses for fuel. I mean, in the form of glucose. So having sugar ne- isn't necessarily a really bad thing, right? Like eating a banana just because it has sugar in it in a simple form, isn't necessarily a bad thing, would you say? But I think the problem comes when you, eat, when you drink a soda and it doesn't satisfy you at all. And it, that was 150 calories of sugar right yep. there. And, you know, what good did it do you, you know, mm-hmm. if you eat a banana, you're probably going to be a little more full. Yeah. Yep. And that was just, excuse me, sustained energy from it and within exactly. the nutrients as well. So, so done with that one. What, are there any other myths or pet peeves that you guys have? Um, um. Mine is probably, we kind of talked about in school, but there was a little bit of a like eggs are bad, this whole cholesterol thing for a little while, um, that like cholesterol is really bad for you and eggs have a ton of cholesterol. Um, and so that's not talked as much in like the everyday world, um, just kind of more in like the nutrition world, but I've heard that like, though. Yeah, eggs yeah. are not bad for you. Um, cholesterol is not bad for you. You need some. Obviously, you shouldn't just eat like a ton of eggs every day, but like it's fine to have some. And yeah, it's probably like one of those cholesterol things where, isn't bad. Yeah, you eat fifty eggs at a time, and it, you know there <laughs> will be problems. But that's probably that's yeah. the same for everything. You know. Yep. So. Um, yeah, and like with that, like when you eat cholesterol, it doesn't raise your cholesterol blood levels, which is a myth that goes along with it too. Oh. So people usually don't know that, but I think that was the biggest one for all. And then just like the thing that bothers me the absolute most is just like the whole scare of carbs. And then you also have a group of people that's like scared of fat because fat's bad, kind of like you're saying before, but healthy fat's really good for you. And then like I keep saying, like carbs are really good to fuel your body. And so you just kind of have those two groups that are hating on, like not hating on, but like scared of two of the giant macros out of the three. And so it's just kind of like, you can never win. Like people yeah. are always scared of something. Yeah. I mean, so then what are you going to, what's left? Just yeah. protein <laughs> only? I mean, what does that mean too? Because you can't eat, can't eat that steak then because you're eating some fat with it too. You know, you can't have actual foods because there's always going to be a mix of macronutrients in there somewhere. So you have to have strictly supplements in the form of protein. That's, that's nonsense, I think. Dried yeah. fat-free chicken jerky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the rest of your life. God, oof. Stomach's yeah. going to be 
clogged yeah. in no time. <laughs> But yeah, that's where it comes back to like long ago. I think that's kind of why like the paleo and stuff is a little more popular, like diets like that of like eat off the land, like what did they used to eat? Like, but that's where it can get really balanced of like eat some meat and eat some grain that's not bad, like carbs, and then eat a bunch of fruits and vegetables. And that will kind of across the board really help just check off each one of those boxes. And that's kind of what you're going for is just you want to be sustaining your body in every single aspect of what it needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Maria, because like you said before, people are scared of the categories sometimes. And so then they exclude food that shouldn't be excluded just because it, it fits into the category. Like we were talking about carrots with and the, the keto diet, you know, they, they have too much carbohydrates. Well, carrots are are good for you um so i i like to think of it as like when i eat a meal or eat a food the the uh goodness factor of how i feel like 30 minutes after i eat do i feel good and if i do well then that food is is probably good for me like today i had a huge burrito for lunch <laughs> just this massive burrito and i felt a, an hour later i felt super tired i felt groggy I wish I could have took a nap. I had to drink coffee to help me focus at work. And so that's probably not the best food for me then because it's going to feel really terrible. Um, and same thing with like Doritos or chips or soda, you know, it, it doesn't make me feel good. So, well, it's probably not good for me as whereas uh, roasted vegetables with a little chicken that I feel really good after a meal like that. And that's a good point about, you know, how do you feel after eating it? Because there's this, this smoothie that um, my mom had a recipe for. It was, it was like a pre-workout smoothie. Like you drink this before a race or something like that. She gave it to me um, for the first time when I was younger, I was running like a, a children's 3k or something like that. I don't remember. Um, but I had it a few times since. And then when I would do it since I would put a scoop of protein in it. And what it was, was I would have that scoop of protein, uh, uh teaspoon or like a, just a spoonful of peanut butter, um, oatmeal, a banana and milk. Um, and I, every time I competed or exercised, you know, after I had eaten that, I felt amazing. I felt amazing. And I, you know, it might just be me, you know, maybe those things aren't the best for pre-workout or whatever, but and obviously I didn't work out right afterwards, but I, now that I'm thinking about it, it makes sense because I'm getting good carbs from the oatmeal. I mean, like dry oats, pretty much. I'm getting some protein. Um, I'm getting some fats in there with the peanut butter. Um, and, and, and I just feel great. And I don't think that those foods are necessarily bad for you. And I think they're great for you, but you now flip, flip the, the coin here if I had eaten Taco Bell right before I did these things, how great am I going to feel? Not, not great. Right. I'm yeah. I'm going to be feel terrible. I'm not going to do very well in my races or whatever it is. Um, so my only issue with that though, is sometimes when I'm very hungry, like I don't eat until night and then I have something that might be bad for me. I still feel good sometimes because I'm just so hungry. Um, sure. So that is a good yeah. indicator though, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think one thing we really hit home in um, my classwork and stuff was um, this whole idea of nutrient dense versus energy dense which is yeah. basically what you guys are getting at but like energy dense is just like higher calories so if I just eat a spoonful of sugar it has quite a bit of energy in it but then this whole idea of like nutrient dense yeah. like I can eat this like banana and I'm getting potassium and I'm getting fiber and I'm getting some calories and I'm getting carbs and I'm getting a serving of fruit like all these things that it's like dense in all these nutrients mm -hmm. and so that's those are the types of foods that are like you guys were saying are going to make you feel better and help you like perform better and throughout your day or workouts or whatever just because those are like crossing off those things and then you aren't eating these huge insane amount of calories because you aren't like sustaining yourself and you're hungry and you're like binging on things um and then you're just going to ultimately eat more calories or too much and like 
those types of things, focusing on nutrients and will also just help you live a more balanced lifestyle and can also help you really lose weight because you're getting all those nutrients you need, not eating as many calories and you're working out and hopefully will help balance you out a little bit more. That's something I heard once too from a different speaker on stuff like this. And he said, <clears throat> he focuses on like the idea of, of the ratio between the calories in your food and the nutrients in them. So mm. like, if, like, a, like you're saying a spoonful of sugar, high calorie, you know, with not so much nutrients in it or actually, well, diverse nutrients versus broccoli, for example, you know, very low in calorie, but has very high content of, of, you know, nutritional value that it's going to give you. Um, and then if you say, use that same mindset to have, okay, well this, I already had a good amount of this nutrient today. Maybe I eat another food that's high in this nutrient, you know? Um, so I think like, like you're saying, yeah, you know, variety of foods is the best way to get all those nutrients. Um, yeah. So what did we learn today? We learned, geez, I can't even think that potatoes do not have gluten, right? <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that's that's the only thing we learned today <laughs> so it I, I think the only problem though is that people who listen to this are still gonna they're gonna brush it off a lot if it comes if their goal is really just to get in the weight room and get big because that's a lot of the kids that i know in college that's just what their goal is get in the weight room and get big you know um and and I don't know how to kind of push micronutrients and like eating a, a variety of foods and good diet because we've heard it since the day we were born, you know, eat, eat your vegetables, eat moderation, don't mm -hmm. binge yourself. Um, so I hope today people kind of realize that there's more to foods than just the macronutrients, I think is a lot of what I wanted to achieve, which I think we did pretty well. Um, but I guess, I guess my only other question I forgot about this is we talked a little bit about this, the water you said it's like a micronutrient or macronutrient or whatever. And people always know too. drink your water, but why, why? I mean, you, you feel thirsty and you feel lightheaded sometimes, but what does water really achieve in your body and why do we need it? Yeah, it helps, I believe, in, like, the whole um, osmosis type stuff that's happening with your cells. Like, if you don't drink water throughout a whole day and you become really dehydrated, um, then one side of, I think it's the outside of the cell will become more concentrated and then water will move out of your cell, thus shrinking everything, um, not causing healthy like biochemical processes so water just helps balance all like the osmosis of different um like even throughout the barrier of your cells like moving sodium and potassium that cross the border to help spur on functions of like your brain and stuff like that so kind of even down to the cell level it's helping with movement of um different processes different nutrients and all that i would imagine that your like plasma is is made up of mostly water and i would i mean i i don't have anything to back this up that's just my like my first thought goes to like plasma looks you know it's it's got to be filled with water and i can imagine if you're dehydrated that's got to deplete so is that i mean maybe that has no backing to it but is that viable at all i mean no. i think I don't yeah. know about plasma specifically, but I know blood has some water in it at least. Yeah. So I would assume, I think just anything in your body obviously is made up of cells and your cells need that water. Like I was saying to yeah. have function. So just throughout, and then it just like helps your brain. Um, I think from shrinking a little and helps you more focus, but yeah, it is important because your body is like 60% water. It helps move things throughout your kidneys, help things toxify or like detoxify things. 
um, helps move, yeah, through its huge part in the kidneys, um, whether it should like reabsorb sodium and stuff, again, for cells or like whether it should help water and sodium are kind of paired mm -hmm. for whether it should like leave the body or like be recycled and stuff like that. Awesome. All right. We're going to run out of time here pretty soon, I think, but I just want to thank you guys again for coming on with your busy schedules and things like that for making the time out to do this. And this was, this was a really good uh, informational episode. Um, and I hope that whoever's listening can uh, heed our advice about just, you know, you might not see the effects of, of your diet now. And, um, but, you know, sooner or later you might, uh, if circumstance comes to it. So, um, we all know yeah. have a well-rounded diet. I mean, I don't think that's changed in our, throughout the episode, just eat well. I mean, we all know what's good for us and what's not, but also, uh, don't kill yourself because you have to be sustainable too. In the end, do what's sustainable. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Willie. And yeah. one last question for you. What do you, what are you doing drinking? diet soda <laughs> uh i'm do, i'm drinking diet soda because my mouth gets very very dry on things like this when i'm talking and uh -huh. by the time i was down here ready it was too late for me to go up and get a glass of water from the room so i went to the vending machine machine right here and then i was like well should i get this regular pepsi probably not i'll get this diet pepsi <laughs> so, yeah, you're on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's diet right so it's got to be for people on a diet it's good for you yeah all right thanks guys yep bye, bye. Yep.